And what a joy is to see you all here this evening. And welcome to everyone on the internet around the world who are able to tune in and join with us here in New York City. It truly is a treat to be able to include you in this event. And what a joy to be here with you. I've really been looking forward to this, actually for a long time, to be here with you this evening and share some ideas and think along with you, pray together here and listen for what is, what makes Christmas special in the first place? What is the spiritual significance of Christmas that needs to be honored and appreciated? I certainly have a lot of fond memories of Christmas over the years. I have to say, probably my very absolute favorite is the year that I proposed to my wife. It was on Christmas Eve, right next to this very special Christmas tree I had personally picked out for the occasion and decorated with these what I thought were super snazzy red and gold Christmas ornaments that I bought at the local Payless department store, which my wife later told me looks like something you might see in a, one of those bordellos in old Wild West movies on TV. <laughs> However, when I popped the big question, my choice in colorful, shiny Christmas ornaments did not discourage her. And she said, yes, I'd be happy to marry you. And I was the happiest man on earth. And we have been very happily married ever since. I think we're counting up around 28 years now. Although I did have to part with those Christmas ornaments eventually, yeah. But that was easy to do. We all probably have our own Christmas memories over the years. Some perhaps really good, some well, maybe not so good. If we get too caught up into the secular aspects of celebrating the holiday with all the hustle and bustle, the shopping and the spending and the eating and the partying and oh man, how to pay for it all when we're done. I might feel more like an endurance test or a, a survival of the fittest. How are we going to get through this in one piece? Uh, or if you're on the other side of the spectrum where you might feel lonely and left out, uh, not included in all the festivities. Or maybe you don't see any reason for Christmas in the first place and, and you're asking the question, what is the point? And you'd be just fine with it just vanishing off the calendar. Whichever side of the spectrum you might be on, there is a reason for Christmas, a spiritual purpose behind Christmas that truly can make it an occasion of delight and joy, inspiration, and even healing. And that's the direction I'd like to head here with you this evening. The original purpose of Christmas is to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ the Son of God who was sent to the world to preach God's love and God's care and also to point the way to eternal life. But there's more to Christmas than just the birth of baby Jesus. There is this gift of Christian healing which Jesus brought to the world to help us experience that love and care of God in a very real, meaningful, and tangible form right up on through today and for all time to come. This Christian healing, though, there's a lot of people who, who would argue that, oh, that's a thing of the past. That, that, that's, that's not relevant today any longer. That's, that's unique to Jesus' time. And uh, we shouldn't expect to go to God in prayer like we read about in the Bible, you know, and find healing of mind, spirit, and the body. Uh, no, you know, we have all types of material ways and means to deal with all our problems today. We don't need God in prayer, you know, we can handle it on our own. But I'd like to share with you a perspective, a Christian science perspective that argues to the contrary, that indeed Christian healing, it is relevant today. In fact, it's more relevant than ever before, especially in light of mankind's deep and wide search for health and peace on earth that it is possible to turn to God and find healing, not just of the mind and the spirit, but of the body too. And Christian science explains how to do this. Now, now I do understand, you know, many of you may be wondering what Christian science is, because there are a lot of misunderstandings in the public consciousness about Christian science, and I hope I can clear up many of those tonight. So just to be clear here, right from the beginning, when I say Christian science, I'm not talking about any type of mind over matter method. I'm not talking about faith healing. I'm not talking about um, positive thinking, just hold a right thought, things will get better. 
you know, that can be helpful, but that's not where we're headed here. I'm, I'm not talking about another form of meditation. It's definitely not Scientology. It's not medical. It's not pharmaceutical. Christian science is how Jesus Christ healed when he went to God in prayer. That there's a science there to the healing works of Christ to be discerned and understood. That Mary Baker Eddy, the one who discovered Christian science, saw this science at work in the life of Jesus Christ. She gained an understanding of it and successfully put it into practice. It's a prayer-based approach to healing which anybody can learn. So, the original reason for Christmas may have started with the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, but it's this gift of Christian healing which Jesus brought to the world that makes Christmas relevant to us today to help us find our salvation from the sins of the mortal mind, from the sufferings of the flesh, to experience life at one with God. Healing, it is possible. You can go to God in prayer and find the help that you need mind, spirit, and the body. And Christian science explains how. I'll give you examples as I move along here. I, I briefly mentioned Mary Baker Eddy, the one who discovered Christian science. From a young age, she was on a, uh, a quest to understand God. She really was. She just had this deep hunger to understand God and know God. And she actually was raised on the Bible by her parents, who were two very devout Christians. And uh, she learned to love the Bible from a very young age. And she loved the stories. She loved the, 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 the parables and the healing examples and uh, also the promises of healing, of going to God in prayer. As she grew older and matured in understanding, she really wanted to understand how how do you experience this healing power of God in a real way in your life? And uh, she actually had an incentive to pray one of these prayers that heal because she had a number of health problems that just didn't yield, you know, over the years. The, the medical community had no solution. Um, she tried other, other forms of healing. Oh, you know, hydropathy, homeopathy, diets, uh, mind cure techniques. Once in a while, she would find relief. But it would always be temporary, you know, and the pain and suffering would return. Here we go again. But she never lost her faith in God. You know, she always had that faith in God. And actually, a few decades went by here. And finally, she had a pivotal experience, changed everything. Finally helped her, set on track here to figure out the how-to of Christian healing. And just briefly, what happened, she suffered this, this severe crippling injury, paralyzed her, a lot of internal injuries, laid her up in bed, a lot of pain. Those around her weren't sure she was even going to live through it. It was that serious. There just seemed to be no human help available at all. And there she lay, helpless as can be. As would have been her custom, she asked for a Bible. She went to God in prayer. And while she was listening and thinking of the healing works of Jesus and the promise, you know, now I can experience this healing power of God. She had this dramatic influx of spiritual light. Just this, this revelation, she said, right direct from God that revealed to her life in spirit. And the effect on her was so dramatic, it instantly recovered her. She actually could get up and walk around. It seemed like a miracle to those who witnessed it happen. But the big significance of that experience for her was this, this revelation of life in spirit. And she wanted to understand what was the connection between glimpsing life and spirit and how, how did that translate into physical healing, which she experienced. She wanted to know, and she found answers. She found answers to this question. And basically, what she saw there was, we are living our eternal spiritual life right now. Yeah, that's a big concept to get around. You know, let me help you work, work through that one. We're living our eternal spiritual life right now. Let me just ask you a question. Is there anybody here who believes in eternal life? That there's more to life than this? All right, look at all those hands go up. All right, great group here. <laughs> all right, so let me ask you another question. When does your eternal life start? It never, his never started. When did yours start? It started right now. What about yesterday? <laughs> well, you know, this is sort of a trick question, isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of a trick question because the very definition of eternal is no beginning and no end. It's like a circle. It just is. 
And so Mrs. Eddy began to see that this is what Jesus understood about life, that it is spiritual, that it is eternal, and we are living it right now. Because if you believe in eternal life, you have to accept that you're already living it. It does not have a starting point. And Jesus did not teach it starts after you die. That's not what he taught. In fact, quite the opposite. He taught that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? How close is your hand? Yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, mine's attached. I can use it. Jesus' sense of all the blessings of God was not a far-off, remote place that someday you might find or die into. Jesus' sense of heaven's blessings was right here, right now. Life and spirit, Mrs. Eddie, was starting to fall together in her thinking. And of course, this eternal spiritual life that we possess as children of God, it's whole and complete. It includes everything that makes you, you your mobility, your ability uh, to reason, to think, to be conscious, your vision, your hearing, your faculties, uh, your health are all included in this package called eternal life. And you have it right now to experience its benefits and its blessings. And this is what Jesus was constantly doing, helping people experience more of the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. He taught the kingdom of God is within you. Whoa. Really let that sink in. Within you. Now, that's really close. But, but within what? You know, within the brain? Uh, within the heart? Uh, within any part of the body? Within the pleasure of the senses? Um, within the house that you live in? New York City? Where is this kingdom of heaven? No, not within any place material but within spiritual consciousness. Spiritual consciousness, which is what Jesus had. This is what he was bringing to earth. This is part of it. This is what Christmas really was all about, this gift of spiritual understanding that Jesus was bringing to humanity that you were already this beloved child of God. You were already whole and complete, made in the likeness of God. You already have everything you need to experience the best that God has to offer. It's a matter of perspective. Jesus had a spiritual perspective. He was always looking beyond the temporal to the eternal, even while walking amongst humanity. He could always see more. I mean, for example, let's take the, the story of the widow of Nain. Any of you heard that story if you read in the New Testament? So this widow woman, her, her son dies. Probably a tragedy for her, probably an economic disaster. He dies. And there's a funeral possession taking him out of town, and he's laid out on a stretcher, and uh, Jesus happens to come by. Good timing. He stops the procession. He walks up to the stretcher, and he says to this body, uh, young man, I say to thee, arise. Who was he talking to? I mean, honestly. It was a dead body, buried to be, you know, wrapped to be buried. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the boy. He could see that boy alive and well because Jesus saw beyond the temporal to the spiritual. He saw that child the way God made that child and the way God understood that child to be. And his understanding was so clear, he could bring it out in the human experience and improve it. Young man, I say to thee, arise. And the boy responded. He got up and he was well. Same thing with Lazarus, right? Lazarus, how long did he lay in the tomb? Four days. Dead? That's a long time, you know. Four days. Here comes Jesus. Hey, Lazarus, come on out of there. Who was he talking to? I mean, honestly. He was talking to Lazarus. He saw beyond the temporal, beyond the material, beyond the physical, to the eternal even though he was standing right here on earth, just like the rest of us. He could see more. And he understood it 
to be reality. You see, the spiritual was reality to Jesus Christ. This was, this was part of the revelation that came to Mary Baker Eddy. She began to see that in the mind of Christ, from Jesus' point of view, there are not two realities. There is not a material reality and a spiritual reality. There's just one, and it's spiritual. And this is why Jesus did not teach his followers to build up castles on this earth. Don't put your faith in things that can be taken from you, that can be robbed and stolen, that rust and corrupt and decay. Why did he teach that? Because he knew that wasn't substance. To be real substance, it has to last forever. And only the things of the Spirit last forever. And that's what Jesus valued. And that's what he taught his followers to love and to cherish, the things of the Spirit. And he also knew that's where your life came from. And that's what sustained you and sourced you was Spirit, God. This was a revelation to Mrs. Eddy. This was the missing link that brought her pursuit of Christian truth all together there, that there's just one reality, God's reality. Perfect God, perfect man, perfect universe. This is what Jesus understood. This is what he could see, and this is what he was striving to teach all around him. This was his Christmas message. This was the coming of the Comforter for Mrs. Eddy. Jesus promised the Comforter would come and teach you all things, pull it all together there. She started putting this, this understanding of life and spirit into practice and became a phenomenal healer herself. She healed herself of these long-standing health problems, and she is healing people all around her, just one at a time, of blindness, of deafness, of lameness. She healed people of their drug addictions. She healed um, insa insanity. She raised countless people from their deathbeds through this understanding of life and spirit, looking at them from a spiritual point of view and helping them experience it too. And she took everything she learned about how to heal from what she learned and studied in the Bible, shared it with the world in the form of her major work, this book titled Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. In here she wrote down what she learned about how to do it by looking at yourself, your friends, your neighbors from a spiritual point of view. Uh, if you've never read this book, it's filled with some powerful ideas, some powerful truths. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, it is meant in no way to be a replacement for the Bible. There's, there's just one Bible. But Science and Health is a book written by someone who has some tremendous experiences from reading the Bible, from studying it. And, you know, we don't all have to learn everything the hard way. We can learn from other people's good experiences. And she had some very good experiences. You know, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I met a woman who uh, shared with me her story about what happened in her life when she was uh, introduced to science and health. She said at the time, her doctor had told her she just had two or three months to live. That's it, from an advanced uh, heart disease that she had struggled with. There was nothing more the doctors could do. Sorry, that's the way it is. She said, I had a lot of other health problems too. Um, I was suffering from arthritis, and I, um, I had uh, these asthma attacks about daily uh, that I was uh, struggling with, and uh, I had to use a cane to get around because of pain in my knee from an operation the year before, and uh, ovarian cancer, a tumor growing out of control. I was a mess, she said. Then she stopped. Then she said, but I had a friend who cared. And the friend gave me a copy of this book, Science and Health, and said, read this book. Read it with an open mind. Its ideas can help you. They can heal you. And so she took his guidance to heart. She took it home. She started reading it. And she got it. She caught the vision. She said, I started reading this book, and I had never felt God's love so deeply as I had when I started reading this book. And, and she was a student of the Bible. She knew the Bible pretty well. Uh, but she had never connected with this God of love so profoundly as she did when she started reading Science and Health. But even more, 
uh, this book started to teach her how to look at herself from a spiritual point of view. You know, life in spirit, there's, there's more than this. You have this spiritual individuality made in the likeness of God that is whole and perfect. Learn to love it, value it, accept it as your individuality right here, right now. She started doing that. A few weeks went by, a few months went by, and she was just enjoying what she was learning there. And, and then one day she realized that um, she wasn't dead. <laughs> She was still alive. And in fact, she felt pretty good. You know, she was getting bitter all the time. And this was really positive for her and very encouraging. And uh, she just kept up her study of science and health. And one day she got up and started walking around the room and she realized she hadn't grabbed for her cane. And uh, oh, wow, there's no pain in my knee. This, wow, I like this. I think I could get used to this. And, and she's starting to, you know, put a connection together here between what she's learning uh, about who she is as a child of God and these healings going on. And so a few more weeks go by, and one day she realized, oh, man, I can't, I haven't had an asthma attack here in, in a long time. And she was healed. Her asthma was healed. It had um, plagued her every single day, she said, for about 40 years. Every single day. Gone. Well, now she really knew she was on to something, and, and she, started, she was scheduled for a major operation for this tumor, and she thought maybe that can be healed too. And so she specifically prayed about that to see God never gave that to her. That's no part of her individuality. It's a lie about her being, and it can be healed with a spiritual truth. She just prayed the best way she knew in her own innocent way there, and uh, the tumor went away. The doctors could not find it. And they said, you're fine, just go home. You know, operation canceled. And uh, she was just glowing when she was telling me this story. And she said, and here I am. It's been five years since I was supposed to die. And I'm doing great. And uh, I think it's been about nine years now uh, since the doctor told her that her life was at the end. But truly, this book is powerful. It has some mighty ideas in there. And, and I've been told that the sponsors have copies of them right back there in the foyer. So if you don't have a copy, you are welcome to grab your own on the way out, take it home. Or as a gift for someone else, if you can think of someone who might benefit from it. You know, Mrs. Eddy eventually gave a name to her discovery of Christian science. Christian, because it grew right out of the teachings of the Bible. You know, like I said, she just lived and moved and breathed the Bible every day of her life. This is her touchstone, her anchor. This is where she went for her guidance and, uh, you know, a source of healing. And uh, then she added that word science on there, though, because she began to see there are laws, divine laws that work in this universe that enable spiritual healing to occur. That Jesus Christ understood those laws better than anyone. But we all can gain an understanding of these laws and put them into practice and experience more of that healing power of God at work in our life. There is a Christian science at work in the life of Jesus Christ to be appreciated and understood. Life in spirit, this is part of the Christmas message that Jesus came to share with the world. There's more than this, folks. There's a whole lot more. Let me show you. Follow me. To life and spirit. A lot of people have a lot of questions about Christian science when they first learn about it. And uh, one of the big questions that I often hear has to do with this, this matter versus spirit issue. Okay, God is spirit. You talk about life and spirit and we're spiritual and, you know, but that just doesn't seem to be my experience. I have this physical body. I got to clothe it. I got to feed it. I think I need medicine to keep it well. Uh, I have a car. I drive to work. I can put gas in that car. My world looks very physical. Uh, in fact, it looks very material. I just can't relate to this, this, that's the idea of life and spirit. What about that? What do we do about that? Well, it's a great question, and it needs an answer, and there is an answer. And again, it's all about perspective. Perspective is everything. Things are not always what they appear to be. You can go out on a, on a nice clear day, and, and the human eye looks out way over the horizon and concludes, oh, look, the Earth is flat. But, but science says, oh, no, you know, look a little further, and you'll start to see that the Earth is really round, right? Well, the same rule applies to the human mind. The human mind looks out through the physical senses and says, oh, look, 
My world is physical. I see material things all around. But divine science says, oh, not really. Just look a little further and you'll start to see that it's really spiritual. And what we learn in Christian science is that we really live in a universe of mind, of divine mind, where things are thoughts and ideas are substance. That what we call a material universe with mountains and trees and, and valleys and houses and cars and bodies is really just a limited view of what exists in the mind of God as an idea. And the opportunity there is to look past the thing, beyond the temporal thing, to the spiritual idea and gain an understanding of it. And as you gain an understanding of that idea, its blessings come into your human experience and lift you to a higher place, bringing the human more into line with the divine. And this is how healing happens. Jesus was doing it all the time looking beyond the temporal to the spiritual. Take the, the story of the, the loaves and the fishes. All right, the loaves and the fishes. Um, if you're not familiar, Jesus is out preaching in the desert. And thousands and thousands of people have flocked out there to hear his instruction. It's the end of the day. He's done. And he's over there with his disciples, sort of huddled up. And, and the disciples are wondering what to do with this big crowd of people who are hungry and have no food. What shall we do, Master? Send them away? Jesus says, oh no, just go ahead and feed them. I can just imagine what's going through their thinking. Uh, well, um, you know, uh, Master, we just have a few loaves and a few fishes here. Um, sorry, no can do. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but uh, Jesus, though, does he see just a few loaves and a few fishes? Oh, you're right. You know, forget it. Just send them away. We can't do it. No. He sees something much, much more. His thinking is just in a whole different place, a whole higher level. What does he do? He goes to God, expresses gratitude, and he says, hand out what we have. Okay. And so they do. And in the end, everybody is fed, and there is more left over than they started with. Does that happen in your household budget? What happened there? How, what was the difference? Why did the disciples see not enough and Jesus saw more than enough? What was the difference? The perspective, absolutely. Jesus had a spiritual perspective that enabled him to see abundance. He was quoted, you know, as saying to, the, to his disciples there, you have eyes, can't you see? Wow, think about that. How'd you like him to say that to you? Come on, you have eyes. Can't you see? What did he mean there? What he really meant was, you have spiritual eyes. You have spiritual sense. Use them. Use it. You have the ability to see what I can see spiritually. Use those spiritual senses. You know, Ms. Zetti talked about this uh, here in Science and Health on page 298. She wrote, what is termed material sense can report only a mortal temporary sense of things, whereas spiritual sense can bear witness only to truth. To material sense, the unreal is the real until this sense is corrected by Christian science. All right. And by Christian science, she means a knowledge or an understanding of how God governs the universe. Okay? So what is termed material sense? It just sees a mortal temporary sense of things. You see, material sense is like dense fog. Have you ever been in dense fog? Do you get fog here in New York City? I know you get rain. I know you get snow. You get fog too. All right. Let's say you get some really dense fog. And uh, it's so thick you can't even see eight or ten feet in front of you. Okay? But you're in a familiar landscape, so you know where things are. You know there's a, the, a skyscraper over there, another skyscraper over there, another skyscraper over there. <laughs> you know where these things are, but you can't see them because of the fog. 
That's the way material sense is in the kingdom of heaven. You see, we're in the kingdom right now, right? The kingdom of heaven, it's at hand, it's within you. You really could not be in a better place than you are right now, this very instant. You have it all. All of God's goodness, all of God's love, all of God's care, all of God's provision is yours now. It's all around. Jesus could see it all the time. But if you're trying to find it through the material senses, you will not see it. You will not see it. It'll be just like looking into that dense fog. You know it's out there, but you can't see it. Again, it's perspective. Jesus had the spiritual perspective. This is one of the gifts that he brought to the world to help us gain the same perspective, to use those eyes, to use those eyes. You have eyes. You've got them. Use them. You know, he just yearned for those around him to see what he could see. And you can through spiritual sense. God's universe is not material. It's spiritual. It has to be. God is spirit, right? Is that not what Jesus taught? God is spirit. Well, God can only create out of his own name and nature. God is spirit. His creation is spiritual. This is what Jesus understood. This is reality. The universe of spirit. And you have spiritual sense to discern it, to experience it, to feel more of it and be a part of it. This is how healing happens. This is part of the Christmas message. Jesus coming to show us the way to spirit, to life and spirit, not through death. He did not teach that, but through life, through growth and our understanding, through Christ. That's what Christ is here to help us experience. God's universe is not material, it's spiritual. Another question that often comes up when people look into Christian science is this whole question of, of evil, good and evil. All right, you teach God is good, God is all powerful good, but that is not my experience. In fact, I have a big old rain cloud dumping all kinds of misery and suffering into my life right now, and I have to deal with it. You know, I have a lot of bad things going on around here, a lot of suffering. Uh, maybe even illness, and it looks very real to me. I don't see how you can say God is good and God is all-powerful when all this evil is going on. What about that? Well, it's a great question. It needs an answer. And again, perspective. Perspective is everything. This is actually where Christian science excels. Because in Christian science, you never ignore evil. Never. You look it right in the eye. And your goal is to pray and to reduce it right down to its native nothingness, to see it for what it is not. And you have to understand the truth about evil to do that, which Jesus Christ taught, you know, in John. What did he say about the devil? The devil is a what? A liar. The devil is a liar. There is no truth in him. Powerful. This is one of the most important theological points in the whole Bible. The truth about evil. Devil, evil, Satan, adversary, resistance, opposition, whatever you want to call it, all the same thing. There is no truth in it. Evil's a lie. Do you trust a liar? You can't trust a liar. Now, you may be really wrestling with this concept. Oh, I can understand why. You might be sitting there right now thinking, oh my gosh, how could he ever teach that? Honest to goodness, how could anybody say evil is a lie? Well, you need to understand the context in which Jesus put this instruction forth. It's not like he just uh, made it up. You know, like it was the end of a busy week of preaching and he had to come up with a new sermon for the next week and he was out on his back porch sipping lemonade and wondering what to, you know, what to preach and da-da-da-da-da, evil's a lie. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Peter, write it down. You know, that's not how it came to him. It came to him from the heart of his experience. You see, basically all the forces of evil came crushing down on Jesus Christ in the form of the crucifixion with the intent to destroy him, to wipe him out, and to eliminate the influence of his teachings from the face of the earth forever. 
That was the intent. And Jesus consented. He allowed it to happen in order to prove a point, which he proved when he walked out of that tomb alive three days later in his resurrection, demonstrating not only for his own benefit, but for all mankind's that evil, <clears throat> excuse me, that evil is not the power it appears to be. God is all powerful good. And God comes out on top. This is part of the Christmas message. Understanding the omnipotence of God, the omnipotence of good, which is there to help you conquer evil. Because I agree with you, there are times when evil looks really big. It looks really scary and ominous. But when you understand this fundamental truth of reality, that it is a lie, put the right label on it, L-I-E, and then back up from it if you need to. Give yourself some time and space, if you can, to pray and to listen and to understand God's power and presence more so that you can see the unreality of that lie. And as you grow in your understanding of what's really powerful and really real, you'll start to find cracks. It'll start to crack and disintegrate and fall apart until it does crumble into its native nothingness. We have to be like David facing Goliath. I love that story, David and Goliath in the Old Testament. Goliath, he was a behemoth of a brute. He was just this monstrous mortal. He was a warrior. He was armed with the latest in weapon technology, I suppose. And he was fearsome. And he was defying all the armies of Israel. Come on down here and fight me. Nobody wanted to get anywhere near Goliath. It'd be instant death. Everybody's fleeing the other direction. Goliath was taunting them. Nobody would fight him except for one humble shepherd boy, David. I will, I will. <clears throat> David knew his almighty God. God. David knew God from experience. He knew God was all powerful. He knew God could not be defied, not even by someone as big and as scary as Goliath. He had no fear of Goliath because he knew his God. He went down onto the battlefield with this understanding of almighty God, all-powerful God. And his thinking was so clear, so at peace, he could discern the soft spot of Goliath. Took his little stone, a slingshot, twirled around, wing, bam, down went Goliath, just like that. No problem. David saw the soft spot. And there's always a soft spot. This is what Christian science teaches. There's always a soft, exposed underbelly to evil. You might be facing a Goliath in your life right now. Conflict, health problem, economic trouble, whatever it is. Whatever that Goliath is, there is a soft spot. There is an exposed underbelly. And when you understand God is all-powerful good, your thinking is in a better place to discern that soft spot of evil and to know where to fling your rock of truth and topple that Goliath down to their native nothingness. God is all-powerful good. We demonstrate it in degrees, but nonetheless, that is reality. You know, why is it so important to understand that evil is a lie? If you don't understand it's a lie, what are you liable to believe it to be? Uh, truth. Uh-oh. You know, have you ever thought that one through? Can you change a truth? No, you can't change a truth, right? We all know and accept that you cannot change a truth. It's fixed. Two plus two is four. Yep, that's the way it is. You're not going to change that. Absolute fixed fact. All right. So if you accept evil as a truth, in your, your sense of life and things, then when it comes along and starts, you know, wanting to take over your life, things start to happen in your thinking. Like, oh, wow, this, this looks pretty tough. Man, I don't think I can handle this. Um, I don't even know if prayer is going to help here. 
Um, I don't think God can handle it. What's the use of even praying about it? You know, I'll try a bit, but no, oh geez, this isn't working. And you get discouraged, you get depressed, and pretty soon you start to think, oh, you know, I'm just going to give up and quit. If you ever experience any of that kind of thinking, it's because your premise somewhere in your life has accepted evil as your God. Evil is your God. And um, you're bowing down to it. All right? So the quick remedy there is to get back and examine your premise for life. Am I truly seeing, acknowledging there's just one all-powerful God at work in my life and over my life? That's the God I'm going to serve. And then you'll get back on track there and start to see light at the end of the tunnel and find a way to overcome that evil and prove its nothingness. God is all-powerful good. This is part of the Christmas message. This is what Jesus came to share with the world that has meaning to humanity for all time to come. That good does overcome evil. Follow me, I'll show you. This is how you do it. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Isn't that going to be fulfilled around the earth as humanity understands more and more the power of love, the power of God, and is starting to overcome the hatred, the source of conflict in the world? You know, the peace is going to come from understanding the supremacy, the power and presence of God more and more, just like Jesus did. It's the activity of the Christ at work through us. Another question that often comes up that people have has to do with um, confidence, confidence in their prayers. They might like the idea of prayer and that there is a God there, but they're not sure they can make it work in their life. They, they, they're not really sure that they know how to pray the right way or that God's even going to listen to their prayers or that they're even worthy of God listening to their prayers. Or it could be um, this temptation. Well, it sure works for my neighbor, but it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> you know, any of those kinds of, of confidence-breaking issues. Well, the first point that is often helpful to understand if you wrestle with those kind of questions is that you're not alone. You're not doing it by yourself. You have help. In fact, you have help with a capital H. You know, it's called Christ. Christ is God with us. You have the help you need. It's always there. Uh, it's the Christ at work in your being, supporting you, sustaining you, moving you ahead. Mrs. Eddy had to learn the truth about Christ in her quest to understand how to heal. In fact, she wrote about it here on page 351. Uh, where, where she said, the author became a member of the Orthodox Congregational Church in early years. Later, she learned that her own prayers failed to heal her, as did the prayers of her devout parents and the church. But when the spiritual sense of the creed was discerned in the science of Christianity, this spiritual sense was a present help. It was the living, palpitating presence of Christ, truth, which healed the sick. And those are the key words there, living, palpitating presence of Christ. This living, palpitating presence of Christ is in you. It's with you all the time. Christ is not dead. Christ is not something that was you know, doing great 2,000 years ago, but just doesn't connect today. Christ is a living, powerful presence at work in your life right now that you can lean on in any time of need. Jesus Christ worked hard to get this point across to his followers uh, before he left the earth as a physical presence. He said to those around him, I'll always be with you, even to the end of the world. Now, what did he mean, though? If he's going to be gone physically, how can he still be with them? In the form of what? Right, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Christ. He wanted to make it clear to all around him that when he went around and did his healing works, when he healed the sick, restored sight to the blind, it was not anything physical going on there. You know, that healing wasn't the effect of his brain going into a hyper gear there, you know, or the diet he was on, or anything physical. It was the Christ that did that healing work. The Holy Spirit of God that healed the sick. 
And he wanted everybody to be sure they understood that, that even though they would not see him physically any longer, that spiritual power that worked through him and healed through him would always be with them. It's a part of who you are as a child of God. One of our favorite um, verses out of the, out of the Bible story, uh, and you're, you'll be familiar with it here in Matthew, where, where it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Wow, this is the Christmas message, you know. God is with you. God. Christ is with you. Christ is the power and presence of God at work in your life. Christ is all of the goodness of God supporting you and sustaining you at work on your behalf. Christ is your spiritual individuality. The city has this definition of Christ in science and health. It's in the glossary where she defines a number of biblical terms from a spiritual point of view. Christ, the divine manifestation of God, which comes to the flesh to destroy incarnate error. If you have any questions about whether you can be healed of physical ailments, there it is. Christ, the power of God, the divine manifestation of God, God's infinite love and care which comes to the flesh, meets you where you are, comes to right where you are, picks you up in the arms of divine love and is able to carry you to a better place, to destroy incarnate error, the ills of the flesh. That's what Christ does. And Christ is always with you. You have the help you need. If there's ever a time when you feel lonely, left out, forgotten, like nobody else has any idea what you're going through, the kind of suffering you're enduring. Maybe you feel like the weight of the world is crushing down on your shoulders. And there you are, never again. Remember, you're not alone. You have the help you need. It's Christ. Christ is there with you. This is what Christ does. Christ is the power of God there at work in your being, giving you the strength that you need, the guidance, the support, the understanding, the inspiration, the mobility, the vision, the hearing, whatever the need is. Christ is there supplying it, enabling you to go to a better place and experience more of your reality as a child of God. Christ is ever with you. This is the Christmas message. That's what Jesus came to teach us all. You know, another question that people often have is, um, just how far can I go with my prayers? I can see dealing with the little problems, maybe. Like if you're getting a little stressed out, you know, prayer might help. Or feeling a little strain in the workplace, you know, maybe a little prayer would help out there. But what about the bigger issues? Even healing of the physical body. Is that really realistic to think in terms of healing the body? Or should you just stick to the, the mind-spirit stuff? The answer is, God can heal anything. The precedent that Jesus left was healing for mind-spirit and the body. In fact, he even said, heal the sick to his followers. He didn't say, oh, you know, if you ever want to give it a try or a whirl, you know, you might want to think about it, you know. No, he said, heal the sick. It was just part of being a Christian. That's what Christians do. They heal the sick with their prayers. Because when you understand Christ, you're able to do that. I certainly have seen a lot of physical healing in my life from going to God in prayer and Christ at work in my own life and in the lives of other people around me. But in my own personal experience, oh, I have so much to be grateful for. Really, I mean, even before I can remember as a babe in my parents' arms, I was healed through their prayers of all types of childhood ailments, just through prayer. 
different things that children go through. And as I grew up and got older and learned to pray for myself, I was heal. I would heal myself through my own prayers of all the different ailments that come along. You know, through the decades, it's been decades now. I suppose I could start from here and go down to there, listing off the different ailments I've seen healed just through prayer. The head issues, the the colds, the flus, the fevers, uh, hearing issues, uh, vision issues, breathing issues, food poisoning, all this horrible illness I picked up in Africa that I thought was going to do me in, uh, heart not doing the right thing, uh, way too much weight I needed to lose over 30 years ago, uh, knee issues, I mean, I could go on and on, dozens. I've seen dozens and dozens of physical healings just through prayer, just through putting these ideas into practice that I've been sharing with you tonight. So healing of the body, it is doable. It's very realistic. It's very possible. And you can have that kind of healing at work in your own life as well. Really, this, this is what Christmas is all about. Experiencing the healing power of God. Not just in mind and spirit, but of the body too. That wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whatever you're dealing with, you're not alone. Christ is there, God is there to help you through that trial and find a better way, find healing. You know, a wonderful story to share that illustrates that. A little over a couple of years ago, one night my wife and I retired for the night and everything was fine, at least as far as I thought. But a couple of hours later, my wife becomes extremely ill. And in a very short period of time, she starts to lose consciousness. And then she rapidly loses consciousness until she's no longer there. And from every single sign I could take in, she was gone. I was in shock. I was dazed. I was like, how can, I can't believe this is happening. But then I snapped out of it. And I thought, no, no. We don't have to accept this. God is here. We have the help we need to overcome this. Whatever it is, we're not alone here. Prayer can make a difference. And I reached out to God with my whole heart to see my wife in her true light. And I put everything into practice that I have shared with you tonight. Starting right out with number one, God is her life. And God hasn't gone anywhere. God is just as much here as ever. Her life is in spirit. It does not come and go. It's just as much here as ever. It's alive and well. She's safe and sound. She's okay. And we both have spiritual sense to see this and demonstrate this as reality right here, right now. And then I went over to the other side of addressing this evil, this assault, this aggressive assault of evil that seemed to just take over and went right to the truth that evil is a lie. It's an illusion of the human mind which we do not have to buy into and accept and believe here. It can be overcome with an understanding of spiritual truth that God was in control here, not evil, that God governed our lives, God governed my wife, God governed our relationship, God governed everything here. There is no evil anywhere. We live in the kingdom of heaven. There is no sneaky evil that can just sneak up on us like this anywhere in God's kingdom. Just God's love is all around. The only thing coming in our direction is God's love and God's care and God's provision for our safety, for our health, for our well-being. That's all there is for her to feel and experience is the ever-protecting love and care of God. Then I went to Christ. We're not alone. We're not facing this alone. Christ is here. The help we need is at work within my wife, within me, within us to see this through to a right outcome and to see healing here. Found great peace with these truths. And I prayed with them for a long time. 13, 14, 15 minutes went by as I was praying through these truths. I had great peace of mind. I really did. My thought was in a high place. I felt close to God. I felt like I was doing all the right things. But no response. So I asked God a question. I say, God, I feel like I'm doing all the right things. What more do I need to do? What do I need to see? And he spoke right back to me. He said, Evan, you are doing all the right things. I feel good about that. 
if you pat on the back there, you are doing the right things. You're knowing the truth about God. You're knowing the truth about life. You're knowing the truth about Kathy. She's alive and well, just like always. Nothing has happened to her. And that this picture of whatever it was was a lie. It wasn't the truth about her. There was nothing to it. it had no hold on our experience. It was an illusion. And Christ was here to, to make this all happen. Christ is the healer. You know, they're on the job. You're doing all those, all the right things. There's just one more thing. And I said, what? And what I heard was, trust. You need to trust your prayers. I had to think that one through. And right off, I, I realized that I was still feeling some personal sense of responsibility about this. And I realized that was trusting me more than trusting God. So I needed to let go of that, which I did. Easy to do. But there was more. A lot more here. So I thought through everything I had done. Okay, I've been knowing the truth that God is her life. She's alive and well in spirit, just like always. Nothing has changed. She's just as alive and well as ever. Nothing has changed. That this picture of whatever it is is a lie. It has no hold on her. It's not a truth. And it can't act or look like a truth. All we can see here is her alive and well, healthy and strong. And Christ is here to make all of this true for us. And then I realized my prayers had become uh, a type of like praying uh, to make a circle round. How long do you have to pray to make a circle round? Very long? Not very long. It already is, right? Okay? So this is what God was telling me. Evan, you, you're seeing it all right. You've got it right. You're seeing all the right truths. Now believe them. Believe it. Trust it. I can do that. I can do that. So that was my next prayer. To trust the truth. To trust the prayers. And my thought just went up to a higher place than ever before. I just, I just, I could see life in spirit. I could see my wife in spirit, alive and well. Nothing was wrong with her. She was okay, just the way God made her and kept her forever. And that's the only way I could ever see her. There, there, there was no other way to see her. And I was right there with her in spirit, where we'd always have been. Life is in spirit. I went two or three minutes with this, this, this prayer. It felt fabulous. I felt free. I had no fear whatsoever. Then I noticed, out of the corner of my eye, her pinky twinged. Just did this little bump. I thought, ah, oh, that's it. That's the sign. She's coming back. And I just said everything right out loud to her that we've been praying about there for about 20 minutes now. So went over it all just to engage her, to communicate with her, to hold her attention and encourage her. And she just came back, just gradually came back, regained the use of her faculties. And we got her up on her feet and she started speaking, got her out to the bedroom, got her into the bed. And 20 minutes later, she was 100%, 100% speaking coherently to me. And, and she ended by saying, honey, I'm OK. Everything's going to be all right. Thank you very much. And then she just fell into this deep sleep. Tears of gratitude just flooded my eyes. It, just, it was a powerful experience. This is pretty incredible. And, uh, but the next morning, she gets up. She is A-OK, -okay, tip-top, 110%, like nothing ever happened. That was Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. Experiencing the healing power of God. And she's doing great today, by the way. <laughs> Christmas, the healing power of God. This is what Jesus came to teach humanity. Not just to talk about it and find freedom at some later date, but to find freedom now. To find freedom now. Christian healing is not dead. It's not a thing of the past. It's not something that worked better yesterday and not so well today. It's just as alive and well as ever. There is a science to it, and it does help to understand what that science is. But we have Christian science to explain it and help us put these rules into practice and experience their healing effect in our own life. So the original reason 
for Christmas. They have started with celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. But it's this gift of Christian healing that really makes it relevant to us today. Because that is the gift that Jesus has brought to the world that helps us find our freedom from the sins of the human mind and from the ills of the flesh, to experience the fullness of life at one with God in spirit, the kingdom of heaven within that is filled with peace and order and harmony, love and life and health. Christian healing is God with us today. That's what it is. It's what gives Christmas spiritual meaning and purpose. And it's also how we can experience Christmas every single day of the year. Thank you so much for your time and attention. It truly has been a joy to share with you. Thank you.